Welcome to TFRS Security. I'm your host, Swapil Bhartia, and my next guests are Ronald Nixon, Vice President of, of Global Defense and Government at Polyverse, and Chris Sitter, Principal Systems Engineer at Dell Technologies. Chris, Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. And today we are going to talk about, of course, uh, the cybersecurity executive order. Uh, if I ask you one by one, uh, you can start, Chris. When you saw this executive order, what were your first thoughts? Because we have been asking, you know, about we need some. We we talk about cybersecurity that hey, awareness is needed, technology is needed, but we also needed something from from you know uh, uh, regulation point of view. So, what were your reaction when you saw this? Uh, when I when I first saw the order. Um, I think you just boil it down to, to two viewpoints, right? The, the government agencies are consumers and industry works as a provider. And it's effectively about the working relationship between both of them, right? Because if you look at the sections of, that are, I think, critically important from the two viewpoints, right? Section one, three, and four, um, government is saying agencies need to, um, uh, you know, adapt, adapt best, practices and, and move towards um, zero trust architectures and accelerate the movement of that to secure services, right? And the government's also asking private sector to, uh, you know, continuously change and ensure that their products are built and operating securely, right? So as you look at that, it's really about that synergy between the two and how one provides the other and becomes an enabler, right? And then uh, I think the last component of that was really about, you um, kind of how they view uh, the adoption of this, right? It's more of a core to edge because they're looking at securing the things that are in place first and making sure that as they grow and they, and they add constituent services that the connectivity and, the, and the, the growth and the number of devices and so forth are gonna be secure when they, when they start deploying those types of architectures. It also brings some, some challenges with it. Um, so it does begin to define that relationship better between industry and government, but it also begins to um, have you take a long, hard look at those systems and integrations that are already established and have been there for a long time. But is the industry ready for this uh, uh, executive order? You have well-established organizations um, when it comes to supply chain and software supply chain and getting to some of those core tenants. And, and so I'm going to mentioned, you know, my, my partner in that, you know, Dell has a very well-established um, operations, mechanisms, technologies around a lot of what they're asking for um, within, the, um, within the executive order, but lots of companies piecemeal that together. They bring bits and pieces of it together. And so then integrating all of those things become very difficult. You know, speaking from a Dell perspective, it is part of our DNA, right? Um, from the beginning inception of the design of a product to uh, securing the, the components that go into that, that go into the manufacturing process, and then all the way to the delivery and, and support of that product with the customer for its entire life cycle. That's, that's been um, a core tenet of Dell since the company was founded back in 84, right? So from our standpoint, I think you know, it's, it's easier for us um, not only to adjust to the executive order and, and comply with the new requirements that may be coming from this, but also it's something that if you think about collaborating with the industry and our industry partners, that some can learn from our real world experience on what we do, right? Because, you know, we've been part of, uh, you know, the board of directors for the software assurance forum and, you know, IEEE and other areas that, um, there's a long lineage of, of Dell input towards, you know, safe code and, and um, incident response and so forth. And so if you look at it from an industry standard and we're working with NIST, um, we're actively involved in not only developing some of these standards, but as we um, work with the industry, right, it's a, it's a two-way process. Not only do we require our our input and our partners, you know, from that perspective to be secure, but we also go the other direction as we work with the output, the outbound side of that. Part of that also has to, is situational. And so, because the executive order was spawned from, you know, from solar winds and from all of these cybersecurity ransomware attacks. Also to a lesser extent, you know, there's some inklings of, of, you know, the response to COVID in there. And I actually wanted to use that as an example because Organizations, so uh, an organization that was 
a very well established and stove piped environment where they had everything on prem and they had everything locked in. Maybe they weren't, you know, a heavy cloud service provider. You know, they would have looked prior to the prior to COVID and said, you know what, I'm good as far as this executive order came out, right? I, I'm my environment is tight, it's controlled, but then all of a sudden, I've got all of my workers who now have to go out and be remote workers, and so now my architecture changes, my base technology changes, and my way that the way I'd be able to even provide security services has to change. And so, so yeah, that maturity level is not just driven by the technologies and implementation, but it's also situational. And I, I kind of wanted to throw that quick caveat on top of that. What role will this executive order play in changing the culture around security as well, where people will start treating it differently? As Ron, you gave example of, you know, this COVID, you know, pandemic kind of triggered that. I would use the example that Ron just brought up, right? You know, from a cultural perspective, there uh, sometimes you're slapped in the face with change, right? COVID is a great example of that. And, you know, I, I alluded to this a minute ago, is if they look at the executive order and securing what they have today and looking at it from a core to edge scenario, for example, that uh, you have to lock down, retrofit, um, fix the things that you have in place now, fill the gaps, and then be able to execute on a routine basis and then start adopting the new technologies. And I think sometimes that's hard um, when individuals are faced with, uh, you know, budget or um, time to execute to get projects done is that they don't necessarily want to stop and take a, uh, an additional view or, or a change to their process in order to implement applications or implement hardware uh, in the case of an IoT scenario, right? Um, and so the cultural change is, is really about how they work together and how they rely now much more on industry. Right. Um, because these things have been tested, they've been tried, they've been um, uh, faced, <laughs> so, so to speak, right, from, from different environments. Uh, you know, the example a minute ago uh, about a power plant or a water treatment plant, right? These things are public entities um, that sometimes get overlooked. You lose sight of the scale of what's in place there. And, and I think um, you kind of have this lax. Uh, feeling of security um, when things are, you know, work at home or they're spread out everywhere and they feel like that they, they, that, that they aren't, um, uh, you know, a, a threat, so to speak, right? And it gives them a false sense of security. And I think really changing that is a, uh, probably a top priority there, right? Right. And since you gave example of the pipeline and I was affected too, and then we, there was a meat packing facility that was affected and more and more we are relying on uh, these modern, especially edge technologies. Uh, you can, you don't need conventional warfare. You can bring the whole grid down, you can shut down the pipeline, you can stop the whole food supply and you will bring a nation to its knees. You're talking about in ransom cases, you know, you can pay something off, but if it is sponsored by a nation state, they don't want ransomware. You don't even know how they would want to exploit it. Uh, uh, and th there's a, te a technology part of the pillar, and second is also social engineering also happens. Does that ex this executive order go goes that far, or still you know we are still trying to catch up with the you know some some cracks that are there? I think I would answer that in two ways, right? Um, you know, as a provider from one point of view, that's one of the many things that that Dell puts in place, and I would expect that many other providers in the industry space. Uh, take very seriously, right? Because it's not just about the hardware components that come in to make a particular product, uh, but it's the physical security, it's the tamper components that we have to make sure that when we're shipping to a customer, it hasn't been um, touched by somebody in the middle, that the um, signatures, right, from execution of applications and BIOS and other things that are, are locked in place, um, including, you know, training our own personnel on how they separate duties and what their responsibilities are, not only in the supply chain, but in the development process, but how that translates to what happens the first time somebody lays hands on it from an agency standpoint, right? We can only go that far. We can only put those types of controls into the process. And, and with the expectation is, is that agency would follow suit, right? So, as we build technologies to support and enable zero trust architectures, they have to go and execute and deploy it and, and change that philosophy to avoid the, the pitfalls that you're bringing up, right? The social engineering and some of the, the phishing and all the other things that we're very familiar with that really have just become 
um, almost a daily part of our lives, right? They're, the the nation state, or if it's just organized criminals, or just the individual hacker, uh, has become so emboldened um, that they you can see it in your email every day, right? It's just all these different examples, right? But I, I think that you have to look at it from two different ways, and it's it's critically important that the manufacturers do this 100%, not just in parts of an environment, somebody might execute something, but it's 100% accurate that we are completely able to provide those hardware and software capabilities and solutions that somebody can absolutely 100% apply to zero trust architectures. You know, SolarWinds is becoming a verb in the cybersecurity world. Um, and so, you know, how do you become not the next SolarWinds? And so like Dell does a lot of things towards that piece where they talk about you know uh, their software supply chain their actual supply chain mechanisms how they split duties then you turn around and you take a small company like polyverse well how do we do it right and so we we have some good technologies in place but then we also have to drive a lot of our security and a lot of our implementations on the personnel side you know how do we trade off code between developers and how do we secure that code between developers and ensure that the code that this guy built is the code that you know, the next guy picks up. So when Mike picks something up from Chris, you know, Chris is able to verify that all of the code that that Mike wrote is indeed what he's looking for. And so from our standpoint, we can do some of that with technology, but a lot of it we have to do with, with um, you know, with, with uh, a lot of it we have to do based on processes and making sure that we have the right people in place. And so from now, we want to get to that point where we're able to automate all of those things, but we're, we're a relatively small organization. And we have found that, from some of that stuff, we can do more effectively from a personnel standpoint, but but we don't have to worry about the same scale that that Chris and, and the guys do from Dell. Uh, but so it, it's so I would say that I would say that the executive order kind of falls short in that regard because they kind of I hate to say it, but they give lip service towards the same keywords you hear every other time about it, best business practices. I hate that term, uh, but you know that's me. Uh, but 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 that being said, um, it's about the maturity of the organization, their personnel, to be able to adapt to still meet the intent of the executive order um, based on what they're able to accomplish. It's really about process, right? Making sure that some of those things are zero touch from a human perspective, um, which reduces a lot of errors and things like that. Um, but it does require a a, a strong trust amongst the vendor community, amongst the supplier and provider community. And if you think about just the two of us sitting here, right, the example from a partner perspective, how do we go through and make one better or what we can learn the opposite direction, right? I think that, that those are all really good points that you brought up. What are the challenges you see? How much of this is realistic? How much of this is just lip service? Uh, well, I would think just generally speaking, right, there's a huge pool of potential candidates to make a list of challenges that you would see when trying to execute this, right? Um, I think it's different for us because we have that in our DNA today. Our challenge is how do we get as close to perfection as we possibly can and potentially help those in our ecosystem. Um, but I look at the other way, if you look at just some of the companies that are either small and they're just getting started or that they don't have as mature processes today, I think just magnitude and time are immediately the two challenges that they're gonna face. If you think about, Somebody, just for example, you know, a top 10 software provider, for example, all, it doesn't matter, right? ERP database, doesn't matter who it is. But the point is, is that how many different solutions and products that they have. And if you're just trying to track and trace every single component that makes up a code base so that you can report it on a software bill of materials, for example, that's a huge task. If you don't have those processes in place and if you don't have that mechanism in place, even if you know what the answers are, just physically being able to respond to a request from an agency or to, to provide proof of compliance and then go and audit your own processes is a really daunting task, right? Um, the other example I would use, a, you know, I, I mentioned it a minute ago about um, uh, like a power plant, right? Just think of the number of hardware and software combinations that you have that would be monitoring, executing tasks within a power plant and the potential threat surface that that creates for somebody who doesn't have a mature process, I think just looking at that alone and trying to shore that up is not going to be an easy, you know, from a time perspective, nor is it just from a, a task perspective. And, and if you could make the correlation back to when 
the government a long time ago said, well, you have to have these FedRAMP or FISMA or common criteria standards put in place and you industry have to go meet these requirements and these regulations. It took a lot of time, right, for industry to go and modify the process to get those things in place. I don't think the adoption of security technologies for, you know, as it relates to what NIST is putting out there specific to this executive order is going to be any different. It's going to take time and it's really going to be how successful you are. Have you been doing it today? Uh, just, I, I don't see if there's any other way around it, right? And so I'm going to just say what he said um, <laughs> to make it simple. But then what I'm going to carry on to that is when you start looking at, that means that the the manufacturers and the software providers from a, from a technology vendor standpoint, they have to become really integrated, right? So, and, and I, I'm you're going to use, since we're here with Dell and Polyverse, we use Dell and Polyverse as kind of that example, right? Um, so like our repository for Linux, right, has 8 billion lines of code in it, right, that we help secure uh, for our customers and through our products, right? And Dell doesn't want to have to do deal, they're already dealing with enough. They don't want to have to deal with that 8 billion lines of code, right? So so you you come to, you know, you come to a vendor like Polyverse to, to get that additional piece, but then, but then there's testing and evaluation and um, just a, a huge amount of due diligence between the software provider and the hardware provider or the other software that we have to integrate with with Dell to make sure that we're still providing a secure product because I can leverage a whole bunch of security technologies on top of what I'm doing today from a networking environment or from a services uh, provider standpoint. And I can actually make my security worse than improving it rather than improving it because I've added too much complexity or I've added technologies that my staff don't understand or I've added a technology that doesn't integrate with my operational processes, right? And so, um, so the integration between the software providers and the hardware providers, so the vendors has to become very tight, uh, but then also, you know, ensuring from a, a buyer standpoint that you're buying the stuff that you can actually maximize and, and take advantage of, or you, or you could be throwing, you know, good money, you know, you could be throwing good money at bad kind of thing, or worse is you could complicate your infrastructure or punch a hole right into your own infrastructure. Do we also need a more engagement, more involvement, more collaboration between uh, government agencies and especially tech companies, especially given that, you know, we are relying more and more uh, on tech, IoT, Edge, AI, ML, everything is moving in that space? It's not just like hardware vendor to hardware vendor. It is our ecosystem. And, and taking the example that we have today, it's how do we tighten that process as we deliver solutions with Polyverse, right? Not only do we look at pen testing, for example, because it's a software-based um, function at the operating system level, but is there a really easy way for us to not only integrate that into our process, but communicate that into our agencies as they go through developing the standards that they're looking for, and then being able to check the box when they're acquiring these technologies and these solutions to make sure that they have what they need, right? Because that's if you look at it through their lens, it's extremely difficult for them to not only define what they're looking for, does it also meet all these executive order standards that we have to put in place? And how do I track that, right? That's a, that's a challenge in and of itself as well. And so um, providing ways and also looking at, um, you know, compliance or reporting or something else that we can, we can help uh, re reduce the burden, if you will, on the consumer side of this is, is just as important to me. Um, because it will streamline a lot of things for a lot of people. And then therefore our, our adoption window goes from, you know, maybe three years to two years, or it's a lot easier for us to retrofit some of those things that we've already got in place, which as I see is the other challenge here, right? As well, while the uh, executive order is immediate, so to speak, I really think that this is going to take a long time for it to be fully engaged in every agency. And there is a process to go back and retrofit and then adopt the new plans that they have in place. There's tons and tons of crosstalk going between industry and service providers and the government agencies. The question, I guess, would be um, to add the skeptics view to it is, are the right conversations always being had? You know, And so breaking down the walls of communication so that those conversations are more effective is, is important. If I take Bank of America, for example, um, you know, they see their cybersecurity problems and their data security problems and their zero trust implementations and their and all of those things.
they see that just as important as the CIA does to their deepest, darkest secrets, right? And you could argue um, that if you were to look at the way the Bank of America does security, you could argue that there are ways that they do it much better than maybe the CIA does. And so, um, so those, those biases of enabling um, government to listen to the vendors and listening to the service providers to say, look, I have a way of doing it. And yes, I do it this way for everybody, but that doesn't mean that it's not secure because sometimes government agencies get into that mindset that, well, if you're doing it like everybody else, then that means it's not secure because it's not special because it's not this. I mean, from a psychological standpoint, there are barriers that still need to be taken down to allow us to communicate so that these engagements, although there are already a lot of them today, can be more effective. Uh, and with the proliferation of open source in more and more spaces, uh, do you think that will also help the problem, especially of security? Though open source itself does not mean the core is more secure. It just means there will, you can get all the eyeballs that you need to look at the code. You can audit it and you know you do know what it is doing. The evaluation of every single line of code and the evaluation of uh, what we do from a pen testing perspective and the software patching and the process that we take to put those things in place um, we can execute over and over again, just as if it was a, uh, you know, uh, an enterprise software provider uh, that was an industry standard. So um, from that perspective, then it, the flip side is also true. We're able to then adopt newer technologies faster. And so when we do want to get to that point to where we really explode that software and hardware combination at the edge, right? As people are adopting 5G for simple things like, like Ron was talking about retail, right? Or we're talking about critical industry like banking and, and power plants and supply chain for food and things like that. We don't have to change our process in order to do it. And that I think is actually an advantage of, of doing it that way. Um, now, again, going back to something I said earlier is that we're an enabler for this. We can only give you so much from a framework perspective. And then once you become a consumer of it, you have to follow those processes within your own agency, your own application, or your own constituency as you provide those services to somebody else. So from looking at the open source community from a cybersecurity standpoint, um, like inherently the process that's used to develop Ubuntu um, or CentOS or another open source operating system with a large community um, you probably could have avoided something like solar winds from happening um, if you had a large community that 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 walked through that process. The double-edged sword to that is that if you have an open source platform that has a relatively small community, then that vetting process is is not as robust because there's not as many people looking at it, right? And so, um, so then, so then it does still come down to the either the the you get a you know you get so you get a company like Dell with a hardware integration piece, hardware software integration piece, you know, so that they can sell it as a combined platform or combined combined product, or you get it from the end user standpoint from you know I am, you know I am Wells Fargo, I am Ford Motor Company, and I am buying this product, and you still have to go through that due diligence process of making sure that that open source product doesn't, you know doesn't uh, introduce any additional risk into your space. Um, so I could say that on, on one hand, you could take you could look at the vetting process that comes along with open source. Um, and, you know, and a lot of times there's a there's a misnomer that open source is is cheaper than than proprietary software. Um, uh, but it just it just depends on how you want to pay for support and, and additional technology integration and things like that, um, because sometimes it may come with. You know, it may come with from a proprietary vendor, but not with an open source vendor or an open source product. But usually, your flexibility to be able to integrate is much easier and better. But but I but I when I look at it, those you know, again back to what I was getting at, um, there are definitely pieces of the open source community that could be used as a basis uh, for analysis of software and to ensure that the software supply chain is intact and, and, and integral integral. Um, and remains, uh, you know, and, and remains uh, secure. Um, you could take those those vetting processes and things and kind of wrap those into a, a software distribution or, or a DevSecOps environment, um, you know, even on a smaller scale. And so I think there are pieces you could take from the open source community um, to, to solve your problems, but also at the same time, uh, there, you know, it also, it will not solve everybody's problems. There's definitely a balance here between 
uh, the hardware community, the proprietary software vendors, and the open source community that helps us get to where we at, we're at. Ron, Chris, thank you so much for uh, taking time out from your schedule and talk about this uh, executor. And, 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 and we went deep into the details of uh, how much it does to impact the real world. So thanks for sharing those insights. And I'd love to have you both on the show again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.